Hello and welcome to the Oak Tree English Poetry Livestream. I'm going to dive straight in, dive straight in, with Sea Fever. I must go down to the seas again, to the lonely sea and the sky, and all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer her by. And the wheels kick and the wind song and the white sails shaking, and a grey mist on the sea face, and a grey dawn breaking. I must down to the seas again, for the call of the running tide is a wild call and a clear call that may not be denied. And all I ask is a windy day with the white clouds flying, and the flung spray, and the blown spume, and the sea gulls crying. I must down to the seas again, to the vagrant gypsy life, to the gull's way and the whale's way, where the wind's like a wetted knife. And all I ask is a merry yarn from a laughing fellow rover, and a quiet sleep, and a sweet dream, when the long trick's over. It's a beautiful poem, that one. I absolutely love it. Um, now, we're going to take a totally different route. We're going from the very, very wet, wet sea to the very, very dry, dry Sicily. Um, we're going to sail all our way to, uh, to D.H. Lawrence and Snake. A snake came to my water trough on a hot, hot day, and I in pyjamas for the heat, to drink there. In the deep, strange scented shade of the great dark carob tree, I came down the steps with my pitcher, and must wait, must stand and wait, for there he was at the trough before me. He reached down from a fissure in the earth wall in the gloom and trailed his yellow-brown slackness, soft-bellied, down over the edge of the stone trough, and rested his throat upon the stone bottom. And, where the water had dripped from the tap, in a small clearness, he sipped with his straight mouth, softly drank through his silent, straight gums into his slack, long body, Silently. Someone was before me at my water trough, and I, like a second comer, waiting. He lifted his head from his drinking, as cattle do, and looked at me vaguely, as drinking cattle do, and flickered his two-forked tongue from his lips, and mused a moment, and stooped and drank a little more. Being earth-brown, Earth golden from the burning bowels of the earth on the day of Sicilian July with Etna smoking. The voice of my education said to me, he must be killed, for in Sicily the black, black snakes are innocent, the gold are venomous. And voices in me said, if you were a man, you would take a stick and break him now and finish him off. But I must confess how I liked him, how glad I was he had come like a guest in quiet to drink at my water trough and depart peaceful, pacified and thankless into the burning bowels of this earth. Was it cowardice that I dared not kill him? Was it perversity that I, I longed to talk to him? Was it humility to feel so honoured? I felt so honoured. And yet those voices, If you were not afraid, you would kill him. And truly, I was afraid. I was most afraid. But even so, honoured still more that he should seek my hospitality from out the dark door of the secret earth. He drank enough and lifted his head dreamily as one who has drunken and flickered his tongue like a forked knight on the air, so black, seeming to lick his lips, and looked around like a god 
unseeing into the air and slowly turned his head and slowly, very slowly, as if thrice a dream, proceeded to draw his slow length, curving round and climb again the broken bank of my wall face. And as he put his head into that dreadful hole, as he slowly drew up, snake easing his shoulders and entering farther, a sort of horror, a sort of protest against his withdrawing into that horrid black hole, deliberately going into the blackness and slowly drawing himself after, overcame me. Now his back was turned. I looked round. I put down my pitcher. I picked up a clumsy log and threw it at the water trough with a clatter. I think it did not hit him. But suddenly that part of him that was left behind convulsed in undignified haste, writhed like lightning and was gone into the black hole, the earth-lipped fissure in the wall front, at which, in the intense still noon, I stared with fascination. And immediately I regretted it. I thought, how paltry, how vulgar, what a mean act. I despised myself and the voices of my accursed human education. And I thought of the albatross, and I wished he would come back, my snake. For he seemed to me again like a king, like a king in exile, uncrowned in the underworld, now due to be crowned again. And so I missed my chance with one of the lords of life, and I have something to expiate. A pettiness. Taumina, 1923. Now, having just mentioned time, 1923, we're going to go to another poet, a chap called Robert Herrick. And he's from a little bit earlier. He was a contemporary of Shakespeare for a while. Um, born in 1591, died in 1674. Of course, Shakespeare's dates were... Um, 1564 to 1616, so sort of contemporary. Um, but I think most famous, thanks to Robin Williams' portrayal of uh, the teacher in uh, the Dead Poet Society, where he uses the, the opening lines of this poem. It's a beautiful poem. Um, it falls into a category which we're going to dive into now, um, a category called Horny Young Man Poetry. This is, this is an attempt to, uh, to woo young ladies into making rash and probably ill-advised decisions. This one is called To the Virgins, To Make Much of Time. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, old time is still a-flying, and this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. The glorious lamp of heaven, the sun, the higher he's a get in, the sooner will his race be run, and nearer he's to set in. That age is best which is the first, when youth and blood are warmer, but being spent, the worse and worst, time still succeed the former. Then be not coy, but use your time, and while ye may, go marry, for having lost but once your prime, you may for ever tarry. Now, following on with the um, the horny young man poetry, we're going for Andrew Marvell's uh, take on this this genre. Uh, his very famous and excellent poem, um, which we shouldn't take too seriously. Ladies, don't take this too seriously. Um, to his coy mistress, had we but world enough and time, this coyness lady were no crime. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love's day. Thou by the Indian Ganges side shouldst rubies find. I by the tide of Humber would complain. I would love you ten years before the flood, and you should, if you please, refuse till the conversion of the Jews. My vegetable love should grow vaster than empires and more slow. A hundred years should go to praise thine eyes and on thy forehead gaze. Two hundred to adore each breast, but thirty thousand to the rest. 
an age at least to every part, and the last age should show your heart. For lady, you deserve this state, nor would I love at lower rate. But at my back I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near, and yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Thy beauty shall no more be found, nor in thy marble vault shall sound my echoing song, then worms shall try that long-preserved virginity, and your quaint honour turn to dust, and into ashes all my lust. The grave's a fine and private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. Now, therefore, while the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew, and while thy willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires, now let us sport us while we may, and now, like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour than languish in his slow-chapped power. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball, and tear our pleasures with rough strife through the iron gates of life. Thus, though we cannot make our sun stand still, yet we will make him run. That one works actually better in a Birmingham, in a Brummie accent. Um, for example, my echoing song, then worms shall try that long preserved virginity. But seeing as it's not a particularly nice accent for poetry, apologies to all Brummy poets, um, I chose to uh, say lie, lie, re, to, to miss out the rhyme rather than And yonder all before us lie in deserts of vast eternity. Um, it does show how, how pronunciation has changed, which is interesting, but not not germane to today's discussion right there was an interesting line in there um the graves are fine and private place but none i think do their embrace i'm now going to challenge that with thanks to philip larkin uh, about a poem he wrote about a, a, a tomb in chichester cathedral uh called the arundel tomb Side by side, their faces blurred, the Earl and Countess lie in stone. Their proper habits vaguely shown as jointed armour, stiffened pleat, and that little faint hint of the absurd, the little dogs under their feet. Such plainness of the pre-baroque hardly involves the eye until it meets his left-hand gauntlet still, clasped empty in the other. And one sees, with a sharp, tender shock, his hand withdrawn, holding her hand. They would not think to lie so long, such faithfulness in effigy. It was just a detail friends would see, a sculptor's sweet commissioned grace, thrown off in helping to prolong the Latin names around the base. They would no, not guess how early, in their supine stationary voyage, the air would change to soundless damage. Turn the old tenantry away. How soon succeeding eyes begin to look, not read. Rigidly they persisted, linked through lengths and breadths of time. Snow fell, undated. Light each summer thronged the grass. A bright litter of bird calls strewed the same bone-littered ground. And up the paths... The endless, altered people came, washing at their identity, now helpless in the hollow of an unarmorial age, a trough of smoke in slow suspended skeins above their scrap of history. Only an attitude remains. Time has transfigured them into untruth. The stone fidelity they hardly meant has come to be their final blazon, and to prove are almost instinct, almost true. What will survive of us is love. 
let's stick with that theme. That's a beautiful line, one of the most beautiful lines I know. What will survive of us is love. Let's turn to uh, Christina Rossetti, who looked like that. She wrote a beautiful poem on this, along the same lines of uh, what will remain of us is love, called Remember. Remember me when I'm gone away, gone far away into the silent land, when you can no more hold me by the hand. Not I half turn to go, yet turning stay. Remember me when no more day by day you tell me of our future that you planned. Only remember me. You understand it will be late to counsel then or pray. Yet, if you should forget me for a while, and afterwards remember, do not grieve. For if the darkness and corruption leave a vestige of the thoughts that once I had, better by far you should forget and smile than that you should remember and be sad. Beautiful. Beautiful. Of course, someone who didn't have the problem of... Uh, uh, Rem uh, asking someone to leaving a love um, in, in quite that way it was W.B. Yeats who pined for his love for a long time but it was completely unrequited uh, he did marry in the end um, uh, but not her and this is a poem along the, those lines called He Wishes for the Cloths of Heaven had I the heavens embroidered cloths, enwrought with golden and silver light, the blue and the dim of the dark cloths of night and light and the half-light, I would spread the cloths under your feet. But I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly, because you tread on my dreams. Now, someone who you would think would know a lot about love was a great romantic poem, poet, Percy Bysshe Shelley. However, it's also worth noting that he didn't really know all that much about love because he uh, was expelled from Oxford University for writing um, a pamphlet called uh, The Necessity of Atheism, which is the absolute antithesis of, uh, of love's philosophy. Here is Love's Philosophy by Percy Bysshe Shelley. The fountains mingle with the river, and the rivers with the ocean. The winds of heaven mix forever with a sweet emotion. Nothing in the world is single, all things by a law divine. In one another's being mingle. Why not I with thine? See the mountains kiss high heaven, and the waves clasp one another. No sister flower could be forgiven, if it disdained its brother. And the sunlight clasps the earth, and the moonbeams kiss the sea. What are all these kissings worth, if thou kiss not me? Personal note, I remember reciting that on a beach to uh, an American girl um, and uh, she, lent, she lent in. I was just reciting a poem. I like poems. I, I didn't have any intention of kissing her. Um, I, I didn't. I, I had a girlfriend at the time and uh, back home in England and I didn't, uh, didn't go there. Good boy. Uh, but... It made me feel good and something I've carried with me ever since. And if she ever happens to watch this, uh, I hope she, she's lived a long, happy, full life um, without some uh, racist English bloke. Um, I'm only racist against Americans and that's not really serious. Uh, I, quite li I quite like them on individual basis. Moving on before I lose my entire audience, uh, let's go to London. We all love, love a bit of London. Maybe. Um, and we're going to go there. When should we go? How about after the lunch? Who should we go with? 
Wendy Cope. She's a nice lass. Let's go after the lunch with Wendy Cope. On Waterloo Bridge, where we said our goodbyes, the weather conditions bring tears to my eyes. I wipe them away with a black woolly glove and try not to notice. I've fallen in love. On Waterloo Bridge, I am trying to think. This is nothing. You're high on the charm and the drink. But the jukebox inside me is playing a song that says something different. And when was it wrong? On Waterloo Bridge, with the wind in my hair, I am tempted to skip. You're a fool. I don't care. The head does its best, but the heart is the boss. I admit it before I am halfway across. On that note, the uh, the head does its best, but the heart is the boss. Here's a poem by a, li a lesser known English poet called uh, Matt Renix, um, who is a lovely chap. Uh, I happen to happen to have met him a couple of times, um, and he wrote something called Head and Heart. Your head is where your dreams are born. But not all dreams are good. They'll lead you down a gleaming road until you're lost in a wood. Your thoughts are powerful engines which can drive you off the chart. So harness your dreams and your thinking and don't let your head rule your heart. Your heart is where your passions lie. But what man's heart is true, a heart seeks out a heart's desire and the reasons in that are few. Your passions may be a thorn in your flesh and leave you among the dead. So channel your passions to a suitable end, and don't let your heart rule your head. Your spirit is born of perfection. It's noble and honest and pure. It holds many answers to life's little trials, and too many ills holds the cure. So capture your thoughts and your passions, bring them under the spirit's control. Don't be seduced by dreams and desires be one, mind, body and soul. That was of course written for a girl um, and what we know about a girl, about girls, well we can learn very much from the absolute and eternal wisdom of Rudyard Kipling who wrote the female of the species. When the Himalayan peasant meets the he-bear in his pride, he shouts to scare the monster who will often turn aside. But the she-bear, thus accosted, rends the peasant tooth and nail, for the female of the species is more deadly than the male. When Nag, the basking cobra, hears the careless foot of man, he will sometimes wriggle sideways and avoid it if he can. But his mate makes no such motion when she camps beside the trail. For the female of the species is more deadly than the male. When the early Jesuit fathers preached to Hurons and Choctaws, they pray to be delivered from the vengeance of the squaws. Twas the women, not the warriors, turned those stark enthusiasts pale. For the female of the species is more deadly than the male. Man's timid heart is bursting with the things he must not say, for the woman that God gave him isn't his to give away. But when hunter meets with husbands, each confirms the other's tale. The female of the species is more deadly than the male. A man, a bear in most relations, worm and savage otherwise, man propounds negotiations, man accepts the compromise. Very rarely will he squarely push the logic of a fact to its ultimate conclusion in unmitigated act. Fear or foolishness impels him ere he lay the wicked low to concede some form of trial even to his fiercest foe. Mirth obscene diverts his anger. Doubt and pity oft perplex him in dealing with an issue to the scandal of the sex. But the woman that God gave him, every fibre of her frame, proves her launch for one sole issue, armed and engined for the same. And to serve that single issue, lest the generations fail, the female of the species 
must be deadlier than the male. She who faces death by torture, for each life beneath her breast, may not dear in deal in doubt or pity, must not swerve for fact or jest. These be purely male diversions, not in these her honour dwells. She, the other law we live by, is that law and nothing else. She can bring no more to living than the powers that make her great, as the mother of the infant and the mistress of the mate. And when babe and man are lacking, and she strides unclaimed to claim, her right is femme and barren, her equipment is the same. She is wedded to convictions, in default of grosser ties. Her contentions are her children, heaven help him who denies. He will meet no suave discussion, but the instant white-hot wild-wakened female of the species, warring as for spouse and child. Unprovoked and awful charges, even so the she-bear fights. Speech that drips, corrodes and poisons, even so the cobra bites. Scientific vivisection of one nerve till it is raw, and the victim writhes in anguish like the Jesuit with the squaw. And so it comes that man, the coward, when he gathers to confer with his fellow braves in council, dare not leave a place for her. Where at war with life and conscience he uplifts his erring hands to some god of abstract justice which no woman understands. And man knows it, knows moreover that the woman that God gave him must command but may not govern, shall enthrall but not enslave him. And she knows because she warns him, and her instincts never fail, that the female of her species is more deadly than the male. As I've been waving my hands around, some of you will have noticed that I am indeed a married man and very happy in that state. Um, and I have my wife's permission to say so. Um, and I, 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 this is almost a hymn in praise of women, uh, though it doesn't sound like it to begin with. Um, and I, I would just like to say that <laughs> this is, though it uses some language which we're not particularly comfortable in our current liberal state, I would like to say clearly that uh, I have the highest regard for women, particularly mothers, um, who I believe are doing the most important job in society. Just want to put that out there. Now, we do see what happens when mothers don't do a good enough job and perhaps leave their children to be brought up by uh, aunts in London. We hear this from a very wise uh, sage, Hilaire Belloc, who wrote, Matilda, who told lies and was burnt to death. It's a cheery little poem. Matilda told such dreadful lies, it made one gasp and stretch one's eyes. Her aunt, who, from her earliest youth, had kept a strict regard for truth, attempted to believe Matilda. The effort very nearly killed her, and would have done so had not she discovered this infirmity. For once, towards the close of day, Matilda, growing tired of play, and finding she was left alone, went tiptoe to the telephone and summoned the immediate aid of London's noble fire brigade. Within an hour, the gallant band were pouring in on every hand, from Putney, Hackney Downs and Bow, with courage high and hearts aglow. They galloped, roaring through the town. Matilda's house is burning down! Inspired by British cheers and loud, proceeding from the frenzied crowd, they ran their ladders through a score of windows on the ballroom floor, and took peculiar pains to souse the pictures up and down the house, until Matilda's aunt succeeded in showing them they were not needed, and even then she had to pay to get the men to go away. It happened that a few weeks later her aunt was off to the theatre to see that interesting play The Second Mrs Tanqueray. She had refused to take her niece to hear this entertaining piece, a deprivation just and wise to punish her for telling lies. 
That night, a fire did break out. You should have heard Matilda shout. You should have heard her scream and bawl and throw the window up and call to people passing in the street. The rapidly increasing heat encouraging her to obtain their confidence, but all in vain. For every time she shouted, Fire! They only shouted, Little liar! And therefore, when her aunt returned, Matilda and the house were burned. Now, some of you out there may be teachers. And you may be familiar with the experience of Alan Alberg when he was a teacher. Interestingly, he... Or, uh, mm, I won't say that. Alan Alberg also wrote some brilliant poems, including Please, Mrs Butler. Please, Mrs Butler, this boy Derek Drew keeps copying my work, miss. What shall I do? Go and sit in the hall, dear. Go and sit in the sink. Take your bo books on the roof, my lamb. Do whatever you think. I've just realised I need a hat for this. There we go. Let's start again. Please, is Mrs Butler. This boy Derek Drew keeps copying my work, miss. What shall I do? Go and sit in the hall, dear. Go and sit in the sink. Take your books on the roof, my lamb. Do whatever you think. B please, Mrs Butler, this boy Derek Drew keeps taking my rubber, miss. What shall I do? Keep it in your hand, dear. Hide it up your vest. Swallow it, if you like, my love. Do what you think best. Please, Mrs Butler, this boy Derek Drew keeps calling me rude names, miss. What shall I do? Lock yourself in the cupboard, dear. Run away to sea. Do whatever you can, my flower. But don't ask me. Good old Alan Alberg. T.S. Eliot was uh, a chap who had a friend who called him Old Possum. He liked the title and he called his next uh, a, a collection of his poems Old Puss Possum's Book of Cats. It was later adopted by um, uh, a lesser known music writer called Andrew Lloyd Webber and became the musical Cats. Oh, done that one. Today we're going to we're going to read from Old Possum's Book of Cats. Buster for Jones. Please feel free to sing along, but I will be reading. Buster for Jones is not skin and bones. In fact, he's remarkably fat. He doesn't haunt pubs. He has eight or nine clubs, for he's the St James's Street cat. He's the cat we all greet as he walks down the street in his coat of fastidious black. No commonplace mousers have such well-cut trousers or such an impeccable back. In the whole of St James, the smartest of names is the name of this Brummel of cats. And we're all of us proud to be nodded or bowed to by Buster for Jones in white spats. His visits are occasional to the senior educational, and it is against the rules for any one cat to belong both to that and the joint superior schools. For a similar reason, when game is in season, he's found not of foxes, but blimpies. He is frequently seen at the gay stage and sea screen, which is famous for winkles and shrimps. In the season of venison, he gives his benson to the pot hunter's succulent bones. And just before noon's not a moment too soon to drop in for a drink at the drones. When he's seen in a hurry, there's probably curry at the Siamese or at the glutton. If he looks full of gloom, then he's lunch to the tomb on cabbage, rice pudding and mutton. 
So much in this way passes Bustopher's day, at one club or another he's found. It can be no surprise that under our eyes he has grown unmistakably round. He's a 25 pounder, or I am a bounder, and he's putting on weight every day. But he's so well preserved because he's observed all his life a routine. So he'll say, or to put it in rhyme, I shall last out my time, is the word of this stoutest of cats. It must and it shall be spring in Pall Mall, while Bustopher Jones wears white spats. At this point, I'm going to uh, going to draw this to a close. The next poem in the list is the whole of the rhyme of the ancient mariner, which deserves a live stream all of its own. I did once read it in a live poetry reading all the way through, and I will never, ever do it again because <laughs> it was it's just too long, and I I I got sick of the sound of my own voice. So. It remains for me to say thank you very much for joining me on this live stream. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, please click the like button. If you would like to hear more, then please click the subscribe button. If you would like to be notified when I do my next live stream, then please click the bell. Uh, I, if you, you will be doing me a great help if you, if you do like it and share it and leave comments. Um, but... Only if you've enjoyed yourself. Thank you very much for joining me. Goodbye.